welcome everybody. We're going to begin our program tonight. I'm really happy to see all of you come tonight to our free lecture on philanthropy and universal giving and volunteerism. And we've got a wonderful guest speaker tonight, Pamela Hawley. I'm very proud and pleased to introduce you to her. She is the founder and CEO of Universal Giving, an award-winning nonprofit helping people connect uh, to um, corporations and volunteer with top performing organizations around the world. Uh, Universal Giving uh, Corporate helps manage global CSR, corporate social responsibility uh, for companies. And she's been featured and her organization has been featured on uh, the homepage of Business Week, Oprah.com, CBS, The Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. Um, I think from a very early age, Pamela knew that this was her destiny to be involved in uh, volunteerism and universal giving. At the age of 12, she took a trip to Mexico and was stunned at the poverty that she saw. And at that young age, she knew that this was something that she was going to do uh, and make a difference in the world. And what a difference that she has made with her foundation and organization. Um, Pamela is uh, the winner of the Jefferson Award, and that's sort of what's called the Nobel Prize in Community Service. A uh, very prestigious honor to uh, be awarded that. Uh, she was selected as one of the 50 leaders to the White House's Next Generation Leadership and Social Innovation event. Um, on another note, Pamela is also an actress and an improv uh, person, and uh, <laughs> she um, was trained by the Groundlings, Upright Citizens Brigade in Second City, Los Angeles. So this is a whole other side of Pamela uh, that maybe you'll see a little bit tonight of. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, her focus is on strong character and work across TV, the web, and the stage. And she loves performing highly improvised musicals. And the, they've won nine out of 10 times in the last San Francisco competition. So um, on behalf of UC Berkeley Extension, uh, I am Tom McGuire, the program director and the host of this event. Um, so I'm very pleased to um, introduce Pamela Hawley and take it away, Pamela. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. And you should not have brought the improv because watch out, I could do this whole presentation in another character. And I might switch characters. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I'm so grateful to be here. I also uh, teach at Berkeley. So honored to do so. It's just a wonderful, wonderful institution and so global and diverse. I just love that. I'm an international girl. That's written all across my mind ever since I've been 12. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. I do want to say one of the biggest criticisms I've ever gotten in my presenting is that it seems so easy. Now, that's another presentation, but I will tell you I went through my midlife crisis when I was 25. And I went through the same time with my dad. And uh, I'm glad I got through it early. But it, just so that you know, for people who look like my life was so seamless, I just want to give a little bit of a caveat here that I graduated cum laude from Duke and all my friends were a doctor, lawyer, MBA, all on this pathway. And I was in a job for one year and I was out of work for a year and I taught step aerobics and worked in a homeless shelter and worked as an executive assistant trying to bring this together and worked as a waitress and got fired because my hand shook. And then I worked in PR and I stuffed press kits for eight months and I didn't like that. And then I went to broadcast journalism after four jobs in four years and a failed business. All my Duke friends were like, have fun, Pammy, what's going on? And then I say I want to be a social entrepreneur. And 20 years ago, most people are like, social what? Oh, social worker. No, no, a social entrepreneur. Oh, an entrepreneur. No, no. And so it was very lonely. And I only say that to be inspiring to all of you who are searching, either for the right volunteer opportunity or for the right calling, whatever it might be, um, there's hope. Because I did not look so good on paper. When people looked at my resume, they're like, what, 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 what? So you know, it, it, you've got to work towards things in life. Anything worth it. As my grandmother, Oma, who was 97 years old, when she passed on, she taught at Stanford up until three months before she passed on. She was the first woman flutist at Juilliard. And she tried out 35 years for the NBC Symphony Orchestra and did not make it in because she was a woman until the 35th year. I don't ever think a day about whether I persevere or not, because when that woman's my grandmother, I don't sit there and think about it because when I was growing up, what was fun to come over to Oma's was we got down on our hands and knees and scrubbed the kitchen floor. And I loved it because I was eight and that's all I knew. So the point is, is that there's so much joy, so much love in life. You might be trying to find the right volunteer opportunity, the right calling. We need to be present now, scrub our floors, and you'll make it. 
okay, because I'm a testament to it because my resume did not look so great. But that's another presentation. <laughs> so for today, we're talking about volunteering, about giving. We're talking about how do you find this right opportunity, about trends in that, and it's not easy. Looking for the right volunteer opportunity is often like looking for a job. You need to really find a great fit. And we're gonna talk first about what you need to know inside about yourself first to find the right opportunity, and then what you need to look for on the volunteer opportunity job. And those are two very distinct features, and we must go through them to understand them. Regardless of what you take away from tonight, it's just good to know this, whether you decide to volunteer or not, about who you can be as an individual. Because I don't teach things in a vacuum. If you work with me or something will change in your life. I'm not about just, this is about a volunteer opportunity. I hope that what we talk about tonight will change the way you think about your life. And that's what it's done for me by being a part of Universal Giving. How people live their lives is a result of the stories that they believe about themselves. Les Brown is a great motivational speaker. If you look back at his trajectory, it did not look so hot. Again, one of those people who just kept persevering, kept persevering, and he talks about the importance of story. To be successful at anything in life, you need to know your story. And it doesn't need to be a grand story, but what is your story? So you need to find that pivotal moment. Now, not always is it something that we're struck by lightning. But there's something that comes to you that makes you go, I want to make this change. And it could be a conversation with someone at a grocery store, or it could be what happened with me in Mexico, which was a lot more pivotal. Now, I will say this. I think you have many pivotal moments. You're not just looking for like one moment that happened. No, they can happen every day. It's so exciting, and we'll talk about that more. We, there should be joy and excitement and volunteering and service every day of our lives. It's not just in one event. We're not just going to the volunteer opportunity. You can volunteer on your way by saying hi to a homeless person, giving them half your sandwich, by being grateful for your day. That's service. That's, that's loving the world, loving humankind. It's not just at the volunteer opportunity. So here's my story, because you're all going to need to find your story and find out what that is and really explore it, whether it's dramatic or not. It could be a conversation. It could be an event. It's anything works. So for me, this is how I came from childhood to global social entrepreneur. This is me. I'm on your left. And I've got little buck teeth and my sister there, and she got the good blonde holly side, and I got the little chipmunk side. And we're at the beach, and we have this very idyllic, um, just as an aside here, I had buck teeth. I couldn't close my mouth. That's how bad it was. The dentist said to my mom, Miss Holly, we'll do what we can. And I heard it. And I was like, Mom, what does that mean? She said, it means he'll do what he can. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to assure me. Um, so here I am, we, we went into operation teeth, right? So we, we went to that and there I am with my little pumpkin and my puka shells. Um, but here came a pivotal moment of this very idyllic childhood. We are on this family vacation, I'm in complete tomboy phase, about 13 here in my eyes, odds, preppy, 80s, right? And we're on a family vacation in Mexico and we went from this cruise ship we were on to a cul-de-sac. We were around this marketplace and my dad and I walked down this cul-de-sac and we see all these starving, begging children. And at the age of 12, I just remember looking at my dad and saying, Dad, how could you not tell me about this? And he said, honey, you're, you're only 12. When do you tell your child about these things? Now it happens at a lot earlier age, but back then it didn't really, you didn't talk about it as much. But it changed my life forever. For me, it became unacceptable. This word just flashed across my mind. I was on a beeline to get home to start volunteering. I grew up in Menlo Park. I started volunteering in East Palo Alto, handing out clothes, handing out food, speaking very, very, very broken Spanish. It was not attractive, but I tried. And I just took that moment rather than going, or took that moment and went, <gasps> and I took that moment and I ran with it. And I didn't even know what I was doing, but what's your moment that you're gonna run with? And it's gonna be several moments something that's just not acceptable to you. So from there, and this is jumping a little bit, but I went to Guatemala. And what I did is I was working with delicing children there. I just went on this search all across the world. I saw on page 36 of the news, all these awful things happening. I was like, why isn't this on page one? So I was like, I've got to go see them. I got to go see what's happening on the ground. So I went to Guatemala and went here. We were delicing children's um, hair and head and all of that. And in these, these, uh, these rooms specified for it. And on the way there, I'd walk and I would see all these people on the ground with handkerchiefs over their face. What was happening? They were passed out because they were so miserable, they were stealing glue from the shoe factory, getting high on it and passing out on the street. So here I am off to my volunteer opportunity and there's people I'm walking by, hordes on the street, 
passed out because they're so miserable. That could have been my pivotal moment, right? It depends on what you latch onto. We've, all, we've had them every single day. It just happens that for me, it was the Mexico experience. But every day we're walking to something, you could see something that could be your pivotal moment and a way to serve. I went to India. And this is very tough. And this does not happen everywhere in India, but I'm going to caution you in advance right now. In a very, very, very remote village, about four hours outside of Bangalore, it was not favorable to have girls. And they took care of them on the stove. Cambodia, beautiful, verdant, green, went there to work with the victims of Pol Pot's regime, major massacre of individuals back um, about 50 years ago, and worked with people who were paraplegics and had had their limbs blown off from mines and all of these awful things and worked to help them give computer training. And I said, this is so beautiful, and they brought me to a tour here of this beautiful stupa or temple in Cambodia. And I said, this is so beautiful, and look at all this greenery. Your country has recovered so well. How amazing. It's amazing you have all this lush land. And we said, oh, yes, we do, because it's due to everyone buried underneath. And that is what all the skulls were in the stupa. It's because of all the bodies underneath that they had such green land. It's everywhere. So that led to a life of vision. And that's what you can do in these stories, is you keep building your experiences, keep exploring, keep getting out there to find and, and grow and find out about what you're going to do in this life of service. For me, I went and I started listening and helping others in a sustainable farm in Guatemala, one-on-one, -on -one, which led to serving thousands. And that's by serving all these other different people all over the world by doing something scalable more through a website. So the importance of our story is to tell our stories to transform ourselves. It's not just to have a story. It's how do we learn from it? How do we transform ourselves? It's about our history. We use our stories to make a difference in our world, to live more of our spiritual and earthly potential. So you came here tonight to find out about a volunteer opportunity. I think it's a little deeper than that. My colleagues always say to me, gosh, you're awfully intense. <laughs> and I have to give you a little bit of a side. Almost everyone here probably thinks I'm an extrovert, but I'm not. After this, I've given it all out, and I go home, and I don't want to talk for three hours. <laughs> and so I'm actually um, an ambivert. And so we can't make misconceptions about people, about races, about personalities, about all of that. I share that because we make all these judgments all the time. And what we're here to do is erase all those and figure out how we can serve to our best spiritual potential. What is that going to be? So story, your life should revolve around your stories. That's what, what needs to happen. Your life, ideally with your job, if you can, but not everyone can. But you want to just see that as much as you can with your life, your family, everything revolves around that story. So Universal Giving's mission is to connect people and companies to quality giving and volunteer opportunities worldwide. We do that all over the world. Our public website allows you to construct a health clinic in Kenya, or it allows you to donate and to give a ball and change a life. So it's giving and volunteering. We also have crisis giving. This is where you can come on with crisis giving and provide serum therapy for Ebola patients. So you can actually come in and provide some type of therapy, and you can either give to it or volunteer for it. Uh, another thing that we do is give a gift. So here's a different way where you're giving a gift of $25 or $50 or $75 to make a very, very concise gift. And 100% of what you give on Universal Giving goes direct to the cause. So you can give a gift, and you can give it as a birthday gift to your friend or give it to a graduation gift for your nephew. The other thing you could do is give protective clothing. I mean, there's so many different ways. You might want to volunteer in person, but maybe it's donating clothing, right? So there's different ways to serve that way. It's not always about your physical presence. It depends on what you'd like to do. Funding a project. These are for donors who are more intense and longer term. I want to fund something that might take longer amount of time. Might want to fund something that I get 100 of my friends involved in and to get involved in a longer term project. And some of them are very interesting, like this one that's popular on our site, Preserving Mayan History. Again, I'm pulling you out of not just serving at a soup kitchen. If you've got history, historical um, knowledge, or some type of heritage that you'd like to promote, this is a way to volunteer, too. Libraries need it. Historical documentation need it. There's so many different ways to volunteer. It's not just go and, and work at a soup kitchen. And so I encourage you to think about what your story is and how this might relate to even your own heritage. Help for Syrians on the run from war. This is a very popular one with crisis. How can you help them and help people in that immediate crisis zone? So I'm pulling these out to show you how many diverse, different kinds of ways that you might be able to help across the world. Whereas often people come in with kids, 
providing a building, school, tutoring. We need to break out of that model and realize there's so many different ways that you can volunteer. Create your own way to volunteer. Finally, too, with give a gift certificate, this is very important because it gives ownership to the giver. If you want to donate in an innovative way, you give that person the opportunity to choose where do they want to give. You haven't chosen it for them. You said go choose, for example, on universal giving, and 100% goes to the cause. So you give that as a birthday gift. Someone can give $100 to help feed a family in Sudan, or they can give $25 to build a well in Namibia. So it can be as customized as much as you want for a fa friend, family member, anything that they want to give that gift certificate. What we also find too is companies are now giving it to their employees. So they're giving it to onboard them, they're giving it performance reviews, and they're giving that gift of philanthropy to show them that the company cares. So it's a very interesting trend we're starting to see as well. Probably one of the most popular is raise for a cause. You've got an initiative, it's very important to you, and you raise for a cause. It highlights your favorite projects on universal giving. And you can highlight your favorite projects could be youth or animals or um, a whole mix of all of them. And you put up an event like your birthday or some type of cause. And then you can list all the different causes underneath it. And you can see all the causes here. You drive your friends to it and they can drive and give on all these different types of opportunities. So it's not just one. So you're giving them a suite of different things to choose from for your birthday list. You could also do is raise for a cause um, having to do with an issue. This one happens to do with one that we've done for typhoon relief. So you could do raise for a cause for a crisis. It doesn't have to be something just in your life as well. One of my favorite stories, however, is the people who set up on raise for a cause wedding registries. They set up a wedding registry and this was a couple and they came from Norway and they ended up setting up their registry to, put, to benefit nonprofits in Brazil. So here they are getting married there and their philanthropy travels to Brazil. Very exciting to see that world-to-world -world kind of opportunity that people can give and volunteer all over the world. Yep, it travels. So volunteer, other ways to volunteer, with women living in HIV, with elephants, preserving elephants. One of our most popular is to adopt a chimpanzee. So break out of the mind of just kind of what you might want to do kind of in volunteering. So in doing this, you need to think about the unique model of the organization you join with whom to donate or to volunteer. For us, our tagline is give your 100%. We don't take a cut on the donation. So if you decide to be a donor online, watch for that. That's one of our biggest tips is there's so many sites out there to donate, but most of them take a cut. And we're one of the unique sites that does not take a cut on your donation. When you give $10, $10 goes direct to the nonprofit. When you give $100, $100 goes direct. That's not how we make money. And that's always been a part of our DNA and always will be, I hope. We just don't change from that. It's the purity of our brand. And that's something that I want you to distinguish is when you're looking at online ones. Same thing as trust. We have a quality model. We vet and do due diligence on every single nonprofit and volunteer opportunity on our site. A volunteer opportunity is not just a volunteer opportunity. Is it well run? Is there good leadership? Especially if you're going international. Has the leadership been in place for a long time? What's their track record? Has there been negative feedback on social media? There's a lot of things we vet. Our, state, our vetting model now is 24 stages. We have both giving and volunteering on our site. We're in 100 countries all over the world. Now that's our public site. As an innovative nonprofit, we have a second service where we go into companies and help their employees give and volunteer all over the world. We vet NGOs for the company employees. They pay us to do that. You get it for free. We give you vetted nonprofits to volunteer and give with. They get to pay because we do higher stages for them. But that's what helps fundraise for us. So we get donations, but we also get this company support as well too. So if you're involved with a nonprofit and you go to volunteer and you go to donate with them, think about how you can help them with fundraising. Is it fundraising or do you help set up a different innovative model that helps generate revenue for them? Part of your volunteer experience with them might be helping them figure out different fundraising strategies. That might be another thing you might do. So with our NGO vetting, these are all the different kinds of things we do on vetting. Many, many, many different ones. But you can see how intense this is. We're dealing with fraud, with terrorism, all of that. It's not light, especially when we're dealing with international. We want to make sure that when you give, it's secure, and when you volunteer, it's secure. When you show up there, it's a positive experience. So here are some of our clients as well, um, all these ones that, that work with us. And I think our key you know, milestones, as we talked about, is being at the White House and having you know, 15,000 volunteers. And it's translated into $24 million worth of volunteer hours. And we know that because the value of a volunteer hour is about $20 an hour. So we know that we've donated more than $24 million of volunteer hours. When you go and volunteer with a nonprofit, help them with this information. 
how can they monetize what they're doing and better display it? If you go and volunteer in marketing, help them with this kind of marketing information about how they can market their results. You could market skills-based or you could market just hands-on, just building something. But there are ways you can help them think about their business in a different way. Many of you are business people. You can do that and be a great benefit to them. So Universal Giving is the go-to site for giving and volunteering across the world. And our vision is to create a world where giving and volunteering are a natural part of everyday life. Giving and volunteering are natural part of everyday life. The way we look at it, it should be as natural as you wanting to go to Chipotle or In-N-Out. That's how popular it is in California. I think everyone's been there. If it's been that popular for you all to do that, then it's that popular for you to be able to donate. If you're going to take the hamburger bite, you can give $5 as well. That's how we feel about it. So how am I going to serve? You've seen my story. You've seen that trajectory and how it leads into universal giving. So for you all, as you think about how are you going to serve, there's a first level of service, which is always informal first, before we get into any type of volunteer opportunity. This level of, of service is informal, and it's in our day-to-day -day lives. We need to take care of friends and family, being present for your family when you get home, putting dinner and meals on the table, helping your neighbor, listening to your coworkers, putting on brunch for your community, being present at your church or meditation. So as we look at this, this is holistically in your life about how are you going to serve? In a way, this is giving of your time. If you're not putting these things in place, then why are we out there helping others? The reason why most nonprofits exist is because the family and the community broke down. So whatever sense of family you have could be good friends. A lot of my good friends I consider family. Maybe it's only one parent. I have an intern with me and she's 20. She doesn't have any parents, but she's got her family because she's adopted parents around her who weren't her parents. So we all have a sense of family somewhere. We've got to find that. And we've got to give to that first and make sure that's a strong unit because when you have a strong unit and a strong community, do you need someone to come in and provide a service program in your community? You don't because your community is banding around to do that. Nonprofits are the last stopgap. It's because the family and the community didn't bond together. So create that first because you could be preventing a lot of other things from happening that are negative in your community. Strongly encourage you to look in your local backyard and what you can do first is that informal service within your own life. Look at your day. When you look at your day, are you attending? For me, my nephew's football games. Cheryl's one of our team members. She knows on Fridays when my nephew's football games come on board, I leave early on Fridays. I might make up that time at another time, but when anyone says that they need time off, we've got a trust system. We say, great, you need to do that. We understand, and let's move the deadline or whatever we need to do. Because it's important for people to have balance and to be able to take the time to be present in life. Whether that's smiling at a homeless person or helping a younger coworker with a question, not cutting off people because you need to get to a meeting, this is critical. See, the thing is, you might be running to get to a meeting, but if you're running and cutting people off on the way there, your volunteer service opportunity on the way there could just be wishing someone well. And so, you know, that sense of service is not just at the volunteer opportunity. Not pushing it on a yellow light, we've all done that, but are you creating anxiety in someone else? What if so many people push it on a yellow light and you create anxiety and that person has to go get treatment or whatever it is? You got an opportunity to serve in every single way we live our lives. Now, I'm not saying this to tell you I'm perfect because anyone who knows it after creating this presentation, when I go through a yellow light, I'm like, ugh, <laughs> because I know I'm not following exactly what I need to do because I'm not perfect like any of us, right? But I try, try, try to live this because this is about serving in life, whether you do a formal opportunity or not. People say, I don't have time to volunteer because I'm a busy mom. I get that. But there's ways to serve without being a part of a formal opportunity that we can do that on our way. Being patient in a grocery store line, not easy for a lot of us. Try this sometime. Let someone go ahead of you. You know, we're so anxious to get through that line. And you know, it's, it's, it's minutes. So activities, think about the activities you're involved in. Is it spiritual? Is it PTA, book club? Is it yoga class, improv, taking a nap, Berkeley events? What is it that you need to have that balance and that sense of service to take care of yourself, to watch out for taking care of yourself? And here's my biggest lesson on this too, is that we think sometimes by putting forth the service orientation, that it will take time. But I remember once that I was, you know, I, I'm, when I'm at my parents, I always undo the dishwasher for them. And there was one time I just didn't feel like it. And usually I'm just like, I get over that because I know how important 
it is to serve my family. And you know what I did? I timed it. It takes three minutes. I have never thought about complaining about the dishwasher again. It takes three minutes to unload or load a dishwasher. For those of us who don't feel like doing that, serving our families doing it, just go three minutes. That's all it takes. And that service too. So the second level of service is formal. So these are the things that you need to think about if you're going to go into a formal level of service. Here's phase one. Is it individual or team oriented? Do you want to do something on your own where you have complete ownership or is it something where you're a part of a team? How do you want that to kind of transpire? Think about, are you an extrovert? Are you an introvert? Are you an ambivert? Do you want to work with people on this? Do you want to be super efficient and just get it done? What does that look like for you? Is it one time or ongoing? Is it done in a day where you're done in one day and you spend eight hours doing Habitat for Humanity? Or is it something that's ongoing that you've got a regular relationship two hours every week? But be careful about that because some of the juvenile um, halls that I work at, they have you coming there regular every week, but the flow of kids is so much that you hardly ever see the same kid again. So watch for that. When you've got an ongoing opportunity, ask for that. Are they consistent people who will be there each time if you're looking to cultivate a relationship? Because also, same thing happens in the Tenderloin with homeless shelters. When you're there focusing on, on that, often the homeless kids that come in, they're there every month or they might be there one time. So ask that to find out about that consistency of people. Is it in person or virtual? Some people can write a press release and send it on email and you could do it at night. Maybe you have three kids and you can't do it, um, can't go in person, but you could write a press release or you could counsel them on accounting or you could even do online tutoring. A lot of that's available out there to do things from home if you want and to do it virtually. You can even do that abroad. If you want to help do tutoring with people in Kenya, it's possible. So it's exciting to do things that way if that's what you want or to do something in person if you'd prefer. Phase two, once you get into the volunteer opportunity and you agree that you're going to do it, make sure there are written expectations. What do they expect of you? What is the time commitment? What do they hope that you'll achieve? What do you hope to achieve? Even if it's bullet points, that helps. It doesn't have to be a full job description, but it helps provide clarity because so many people go into a volunteer opportunity and they think, you know, this is what I was hoping to achieve and it wasn't what I thought it would be at all, right? So you want to know really clearly before you go in. Second, under promise and over deliver. Please don't come in with so many wonderful corporate mindsets and say how you're going to revolutionize and change that nonprofit. Understand their history. Understand what's possible. Make sure you understand what they're doing very, very well and come in with a humble spirit. Very, very important. And don't overpromise. You know, just say, I'll do what I can and this is what I'm hoping we can do. Go back to your written expectations and then that will help secure that there's very good positive communication. And then finally, if you're looking for a job, try it out as a volunteer opportunity and intern first, don't commit long term. Say, I'd like to be an intern for three months. I'd like to volunteer, I'm not gonna sign, I, I know, you know you've got a weekly opportunity, I'd like to try it for a month and commit to four weeks. Because if you set those expectations up and the nonprofit receives you and then it doesn't work out, you've committed to six months and then you don't show up. Under promise, over deliver. A successful opportunity entails the following, and please think about this because I see this happen all the time. Vision. You first have to buy into the vision. You love the fact that you love that kids um, are needy in the tenderloin and they deserve to have a parental figure. So you buy into the overall vision. For people at Universal Giving, they buy into the fact that we say we want to create a world where giving and volunteering are a natural part of everyday life. That's the vision they buy into. Second, strong values alignment and culture. Do you like the culture of how it's run? Do you have similar values? If it's AIDS relief, are you really you know, up on the, the AIDS situation? Do you want to learn about it? Is there that values alignment about how not only what they value, but how they run the organization? What's the culture there as well too? What's that feeling when you walk in? Who was it who first greeted you? What about the people in the kitchen? Did they talk to you? Is it warm? Do you want it to be cold? Everyone's different. People are like, I want to do my own thing. And other people are like, I want to be a part of a community and family. What does that feel like in your instinct? There's no right or wrong. Third, people. Have to love the people. You come in and you like the mission of AIDS relief and the people just don't feel like a good fit. Move on. It's not right. It looked great on paper, it's not. It's the same thing as a job. How many times, how many people raise their hands have seen a job that looked great on paper and when you went through the interview or you went and signed up for your first day at work, you're like, ah. Okay, fine, <laughs> I'll raise my hand, <laughs> right? So, you know, that's important. Good skills fit. 
right? There's the good skills fit. What they need is what you want to deliver. Many times people come in and say, but I have all this experience. I'm a Goldman Sachs investment banker. I could come in and change your whole accounting department. Is that what they're asking for? Do they want that? If they do, great. But make sure you're not forcing what you think you want to do on them because they may not want it. And then what happens is you might go do this and then after you leave, they're like, I don't even have the bandwidth or resources to manage this. So you created this amazing plan and there's no one here to execute it. We call that doorstop consulting. You put that down on the doorstep, doorstep consulting, you put the paper down there and someone opens up the door and <laughs> closes the door and goes, wow, it can't come in the house because there's no one here to lead it. So you just put it on the doorstep and instead that consultant has to walk through the door and implement it if the nonprofit wants it. And you might think they're crazy and say, but they should do this. So, really, they should what? Do you know their business that well? Have you worked there or have you just studied online? Having that humility and understanding what their needs really are is absolutely imperative to being successful. And then this one people miss all the time. Imagine yourself going into that volunteer opportunity and look at your day-to-day to-do list. Is it what you want to do? Because people get so excited about, you know, I want to go in and build this well, or I want to go in and work in sustainable farming, or I want to work on supply chains. But when they look at what they're given for the day to day and someone says to them, great, now go please cold call all of these energy efficiency buildings and tell me what um, they use for, you know, do they use solar panels? And you might be like, I, I don't want to cold call all of them. He said, but you said you want to be involved in energy efficiency. What's your day to day? Well, I thought I'd be going out there and finding out about it and learning about it and getting to meet people on the ground and, and studying solar panels and what's the usage? And you sit there and you just shrivel up on the volunteer and you're like, how long am I committed here? And they feel it and you feel it. And then you're trying to pull out this volunteer opportunity to, to keep your commitment and it doesn't really help them because they're training you and it costs to train you. And then you both know it's not going to work out. It's better to be honest. So. That gives you an idea. This is probably one of the most popular slides about vision, strong values alignment, people, good skills fit, and that day-to-day -day list. Now this holds not only for volunteer opportunities, but for jobs. That job looks so good on paper. Imagine your day-to-day to-do list. Different types of volunteering. Innovations in volunteering. Here's something that's come up a lot, slacktivism. This is what people are talking about by liking a nonprofit online. How many people have been on Facebook and someone says, like my nonprofit page? Has anyone had that? Yes. This is considered slacktivism. It's considered that people aren't really active and what they're doing is they're just, you know, something regarding the internet but is requiring little time or involvement. So it's activism but it's slacker activism. So you're considered a slacker. But it's highly social media centric and it's little physical action or involvement. It could have a viral effect, right? More people could want to do that. It's criticized, but to me it's positive. Every like makes a difference. Look, if that nonprofit gets 100 likes and 100 more people know about them, great. Who are we to criticize them about what slacktivism is? If you're at home and you're 80 years old and you click on 10 likes for a nonprofit and spread the word, good for you. And if you're 11 and you do that, I don't know, can you be 11 on Facebook? Maybe I'm wrong. 11 with parental support, <laughs> parental guidance. Um, and you click on 11 links, 11 likes. Who knows how to affect someone in Kenya? At Universal Giving, we have a team of UG ambassadors. And for example, these people just contact us on our Facebook page and they say, can I help? And we get them promoting us on social media. We can't have the Kenyans in our office, but they can be a part of our UG ambassador team. We have them write newsletters for us. They're doing total virtual opportunities. New the potential for writing newsletters, social media. We can garner these people internationally and help them. A lot of them are saying, I'm, I'm out of work. I don't have." I don't have work, I don't have school, I'd like to help. So I look at that with slacktivism and I say, that's not slacktivism, that's activism in a country where you barely have the opportunity to do something or the resources, but they have internet access. So phase one on the volunteering, volunteer in your local community, volunteer as an adventure abroad. Those are two very, very different ones. You have to think about what you wanna do and what you want that consistency to be. For me, I do both. Um, but there were different phases of my life. For a while, I was doing two volunteer trips a year in China, in uh, microfinance in India, working with the victims of Pol Pot regime, and I could not get enough of international. And now I've centered back to local, and I do both. Both are important to me. You need to decide which one is important, at least for your first trip, and try them out. Test them out. Try different things. Surprise yourself a little. 
because you might think that you wanted to do one thing. Look at some of the opportunities on universal giving. Look about sponsoring a chimpanzee. Look about setting up an Ebola fundraising campaign or whatever it might be. Try something a little bit different and see how it feels. Now for me, I'm very causeless, so I don't have a cause. Because once I saw what happened in Mexico, I want everyone to have happy, healthy, fulfilled lives. So I am a very confused volunteer because I want to volunteer in every country across every cause. You, might, you guys might be a little bit luckier, a little bit more focused. Phase two, after you volunteer, fundraise. I try to encourage people to fundraise. Two thirds of volunteers are more likely to donate to the nonprofit. Try to think about setting up a fundraising campaign, even if it's having 10 people over for dinner at your home and ask them each to donate $10. Something like that, $100, makes a big difference to people and to nonprofits. Just having a dinner, cook a simple dinner, doesn't have to be catered or anything like that. Just have them over and ask your friends, can you give $10, I want to tell you about this, have the executive director come speak at dinner, they'd be happy to. Give them a voice. Some of them work 16 hours a day. That's a simple way to help. And if the cost is for you buying the groceries. And don't most of us have dinners for our friends and family sometimes? You don't have to do it, just do it once a year. So you host a benefit in your home, be part of a fundraising um, community for an organization, create a raise for a cause campaign, we talked about that. Pick the nonprofits, if you decide to volunteer with four, pick different, uh, four different nonprofits. Um, you could buy 10 beds, build a second dormitory, paint a school, buy sun ovens for impoverished areas. There's so many different ways to be involved. But remember, you need to marry your story, go back to your story, whatever your story was, no matter how and all these different places you go, go back to your story, and marry it with your calling. Okay, go back to the story and marry it with your calling. Live your spark. Okay, live that spark from that story. That's what you want to do. Okay? So I look forward to seeing you succeed in life, in service, but also, more importantly, life. Okay? There you go. <laughs>
She's been with me six years, is that right? Yeah. Six years. I, she came on as an intern at Universal Giving. Okay. She's now paid. So 80% of the people at Universal Giving come on as interns or returnees first. Right. Um, returnees are people who have larger skills. They don't want to come in right out of college. Mm -hmm. Cheryl would be a returnee now, but at the time she was an intern, and we converted her to paid. She's absolutely phenomenal. Our senior manager of operations was the same. She came as a returnee. We converted her to paid. So one of the best ways is to volunteer for an organization, and number one, find out, do you want to work at that type of organization? Right. And then number two, often paid positions can open up. Watch for their job listings. Okay. If you really want to target it, Lynn, then what I would do is look for job listings and then go volunteer the job listings at those nonprofits. Like you were saying, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Now, do you come from for-profit, non-profit background? What is your kind of situation? No, uh, Teaching background? Non-profit. I've only done um, volunteering type services. What, what do you do professionally? Oh. Or did you do? Uh, well, I was a police dispatcher, and now I train dogs. Okay, cool. Um, so on something like that, think about how much you want to leverage your experience there mm -hmm. and go into something directly that way with nonprofits that are similar that way. I yeah. mean, is it training police dogs? Is it, you know, or is it something where you take the skills from that mm -hmm. and say, look, I've had an incredible amount of experience being a dispatcher under emergency situations. Right. I can be a dispatcher when you have a crisis like Ebola. I okay. can use those skills of crisis and help get the word out about Ebola. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't, some people are like, I want to get away from my career. I don't want to do the same thing I've been doing. But take the skills and paint that, those skills and say, I want to do that and bring it to whatever passion that is for you. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I've already done some of the dog stuff with right. working with the veterans with PTSD type stuff, but that that sounds really interesting as well. Right. Bringing the emergency services. Yeah, part. I mean that's just a brainstorm off the top of my head. It's not. I mean, do that brainstorm. I mean, you know, Lynn, you should be doing a, a brainstorm with your friends, all of that kind of thing, and just write down on a whiteboard all the skills you have, and then how that could transfer to causes that you like. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes. What What's your name? Marilyn. Marilyn. To get, okay, so that was the universal giving corporate. That what we do is we come into companies and we help them. What we do is we come in and strategize on corporate social responsibility. And what we do is we say, how do you want as a company to give your money? How do you want your employees to volunteer? So for example, with one of our clients, Cisco, they're all about education and technology. So what we do is we come in and we help determine which NGOs or nonprofits would be good results-oriented NGOs for Cisco to give to in education and technology. We vet those NGOs, we port them up to the Cisco database, their employees come in and give and volunteer with those nonprofits, and it scales out to literally 60 countries across the world, that program. They pay us to do that. We are contacting the nonprofit, we're vetting the nonprofit, making sure it's good, making sure it's in line with Cisco's criteria. We're not doing AIDS relief nonprofits, we're doing education and technology. We get them up into the Cisco database, the employees come and give and volunteer, and Cisco's giving and volunteer opportunities shoot up through the roof. Now, why is that important? Company brand, why generation wants to be a part of a company that's doing good work, uh, local license to operate. When companies go into developing nations, they've got a good brand that they're doing good work on the ground. All those kind of reasons. Um, and the other reason why they work with us is for liability, because if they have a bad NGO, it can be devastating. It could be a $2 million PR debacle because if they fund a terrorist organization or a fraudulent organization and they haven't vetted it, they go down. Their foundation can be shut down. So they pay us to do that. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your name, please? My name is Eva. Eva. Yeah, even with an N. Even. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I have been volunteering with animals in San Francisco for many, many years. Mm -hmm. and. Um, there's been a problem, there's been lots of problems that you may hear about, <laughs> difficulty <laughs> with vision and leadership, and so literally there aren't any volunteer organizations that I want to work with right now mm -hmm. uh, that are no-kill. That I'm sorry, that are what? No-kill, that don't kill animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've even scoured all the areas around that I can get to on public transportation, so I'm a little bit stuck. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like I have so much more to learn mm -hmm. about animal behavior and stuff, and it's a field I'm really interested in, mm -hmm. but I'm a little stuck. Do you feel even that your time is not being used well when you're there? Um, usually there are places where there's, there's so much um, internal friction that they're difficult for me to be in. What is the friction involved in? What is it involved in? Um, well, there's SPCA. I don't know. 
Sure. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> but um, they they become a kill shelter, but they don't say that they're no kill, so they keep their no kill external. But in the annual report, they'll tell you how many animals they've actually killed. Okay, so you um, got values alignment yeah, issues there. Yeah, values alignment and, and people difficulty with the people issue. It's always been very political in there. It used to be a wonderful place, and now it's not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I considered starting my own volunteer organization just because I don't know. Mm-hmm. I haven't really figured out where else to go. So be, you know, and I would just caution you because starting an organization, I mean, I don't travel internationally now. It's because I'm running a business. I'm in that office five days a week. And I'm running the business of checking our social return on investment, how many donors and volunteers. I'm looking at our website. I'm doing product development. I'm fundraising, right? So, so fundraising. it's 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 well, and that and that's and that's the challenge because yeah. so many people have the heart behind it, but that's changing. Social entrepreneurs have to have a good business model. They got to be strong, strategic thinkers, and they've got to have boots on the ground. They know how to fund this because I don't like being one of those people that, like one of the things I say with our organization, I'm like we have one year in the bank. I don't want my team to be worried about are they going to get paid or not because so many good do and I have to work really really hard for that but I want peace at night and I want my employees to have peace at night so they're not wondering oh we're doing good but what you know are they we going to meet payroll because so many nonprofits face that right yeah. so you know that's where what I would encourage you to do is and this is just an improv idea contact some experts at universities or veterinary or wherever it is and ask them and say what do you recommend our top why don't you broaden it a little bit even for a time okay. and broaden it to helpful organizations for animals because you say you still have a lot to learn right yeah, okay. so you've taken a specific focus of kind of no-kill organizations are there other ways that you can help with animals that might have a more warmer um, emphasis to them and not even that possibility that they would kill or not so maybe don't even take a look at a shelter what if you helped with guide dogs for people who have epilepsy blind for the aged I, you know something like that yeah. maybe it's a companion dog for veterans Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, cats. Oopsies. Okay, so see, I just made a judgment call there. Nope, I'm a dog person. Clearly, oopsies. All right. So, uh, you know, you're, you're like, you're like, I don't like dogs, Pamela. This is not, uh, you know. I have tried dogs because I've sort of gotten so stumped that I went up into the dog thing, but I, I don't have. Well, good for you. Qualities. Right. I did enjoy it though, and I learned a lot. Okay, so, so go to the cat experts. And in fact, will you email me? Because I'm curious. I, I have an insatiable desire to learn. I'm a total introvert okay. that way. So I want to know if there's cat experts out yeah. there. Now, I know with my parents, with their dog, they've got dog trainers. Do they have cat trainers? They have cat, cat behaviorists, and that's okay. an area I've worked in a little bit. Okay, so look into that and find out those experts. And there's got to be someone who's a cat veterinarian. There's got to be someone who teaches classes on cats. I mean, you know, I'm curious about this. Is there, Tom? Is there an extension course at Berkeley on cat trainings and cat behaviorists? You might so. not have a calling there. Um, I'm creating more work for him. Uh-oh, he's not going to ask me back again. Okay, so, um, you know, but my, my point is, is that open it up. Team, this is a really important thing with even. If you're getting stuck in one thing that's not working, maybe you're just going to love a completely different area on that even. Okay, it might just be completely different. I'll tell you after what I saw in certain aspects of my volunteer trips, I'm like, I can't do that again. Okay, I was in one place and I was in a slum and I've always been really hardcore going into the toughest areas. And I was in a slum and I brought food. You think that was a smart idea? I almost didn't get out of there alive because all of the kids were hanging onto my body so strongly trying to get the food. And I, no one knew where I was. And I am down, and, and if you look at a lot of the slums in developing nations, this is not what we see as a slum. We see a bunch of homeless tents. This is miles long okay and and smoke coming out and you no one knows where you are and I was on the ground with 30 kids trying to get the food and the thing that made it so meaningful to me is that when I was able to finally get up and I was so nervous there was a boy standing there about eight years of age just completely unwashed just like the Mexican children I'd seen and he looked at me and he helped me up and he had saved a piece of bread the kid is starving and he looked at me and he just went you just sit there and it's like there's another pivotal moment, right, even? And I just sit there and I'm like, but why am I telling you that? Because I can't go do that work again. That was probably one of the most meaningful moments I ever had, but I can't do it again because I got so scared and it's not right to be that way, right? So, but you gotta open yourself up. So now I'm like, okay, there's a great program I found out called Wildlife Associates in Half Moon Bay. Guess what it does? It's, oh, oh, this is animals. Check this out. Okay, so, um, so, so I went there on a, a Duke event, and I was so pleasantly surprised. I love dual mission organizations. 
Think about dual mission. Let's write that down too. I want to cover all that on another slide. Um, the dual mission, <laughs> this is how we operate Universal Giving. A new idea, a new idea. I tell you a funny thing, Jermaine, who's one of my executive assistants, I have no paid executive assistants or interns, and <laughs> my senior manager of operations said, Pamela, you have so many ideas, you are driving me crazy. So I now have a Google Doc, and I tell Jermaine, I'm like, put it on the innovation doc, put it there, don't tell her about it, just put everything there. And the other day I looked at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder she told me that. And I look at this list and I'm like, I haven't looked at it in months. And I'm like, get the idea out and don't disturb your team, where your team is like, you're going like, and who's going to do that? Cheryl's, Cheryl's very good about that. Cheryl's like, Pamela, I'm just letting you know. I'm like, thank you so much for letting me know, Cheryl. <laughs> just letting you know I'm reaching my satiation point of what I can really do. I'm like, thank you for letting me know. I'm going to back off. I'm not going to email you for three days. And, and you need to have that transparency with your team. Where's that, there's that honesty, right? But that's another uh, presentation. But I think, you know, on this, Wildlife Associates, check them out. They're in Half Moon Bay. They meet my criteria of loving to be in nature, although I do city volunteering too but it's in nature. They take wild animals who can't survive in the wilderness and they provide a lovely refuge and home for them. They have like a, an opossum and an owl and llamas and they're all injured. And it's such a lovely environment, it's in nature. And we went and painted a barn there. But then the dual mission is, is that they bring in people, kids from juvenile hall and treat them that here are these animals that have labels and they can't make it in the wilderness and they teach juvenile uh, uh, kids from juvenile hall. You don't have to accept the labels that people give you about either. What a beautiful dual mission. And so I would just encourage you to break it open a little bit and see if there's something out there. The people there at Wildlife Associates, I know them if you want me to put you in touch with them. And Cheryl has a, a newsletter list. Why don't you pass that around, Cheryl? Newsletter list for all of our updates, which will help you keep you apprised of volunteer opportunities, as well as um, we've got a new TV show we're involved in where I'll be covering a philanthropy moment um, on the segment for the TV show. Um, he covers things on White House, covers new things on volunteering. Here's one thing I will say. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. Everyone here in life has got to have a meaningful life. <laughs> Go back to the slides on family. Go back to the slides on community. You do have a meaningful life. You are giving back. You can do it now. I hope every one of you leaves this building tonight and just says hi to some homeless person or someone on the street and just says hi. Even the bus driver. When I get on Muni or the buses, talk to them. They're sitting there and they don't, probably don't always get to see regulars. And, you know how much it would mean to them? Like instead of going volunteer to go help be a nice, you know, be nice to a, an elderly person at a retirement home, why not go and be nice to the person who's on the bus driving it who might someday be at a retirement home and need someone to listen to them now, right? Like let's do it a little bit, give it back early. You know, you guys can be givers now. Don't come back and go, because I know you guys are going to come back and go, that was so overwhelming. Oh my gosh, she talked so quickly. There were so many ideas. I am exhausted. Okay, don't be exhausted by that. Let it rest on your mind. And just, and I know myself well, people who are laughing, I know that I speak very quickly. Let it just rest. Let it, let it come to you. Let it come naturally about what's right for you to do. But there's no reason why you can't start, you know, giving now, just even on your walk home tonight. Okay? Um, even I hope that helps you. And, and, and just enjoy, enjoy it and, and, and take off that urgency of trying to find something without politics and just go, I'm going to learn about animals and don't commit. Yeah. One-time events, right? I believe we have time for one or two more questions. Okay. I think you, this gentleman, you had a question, yes. Right. Uh, so my name is Saji. And Saji? Saji, yes. And okay. my experience is, is it's broad. It's, it's for-profit, non-profit, and then recently I've, I've pivoted, um, let's say, into, into the social impact sector, hybrid, for-profit, and social, social impact. And one of the movements um, from the space that I come from is the 111 um, pledge. And if you haven't, if, if why don't you tell, why don't you tell everybody sure, here? Sure, people are not familiar with the 111 pledge or movement. It's where, um, where it's, it's a program that was started by Mark Benioff, who's the founder of Salesforce, and it's 111, which, which stands for 1% profit of the organization, uh, 1% equity of the organization, and 1% time spent volunteering by the human capital of the organization, human capital of that organization. And, um, and it's a fantastic movement. Many, many entrepreneurs are adopting that. I'm a big uh, uh, evangelist and, and, and advocate of it, and I've been bringing that into the organization that I sit on the board and advise of. What I want to ask you is, um, on your um, corporate side, um, is this something that you guys are involved or following or intent on leveraging for what you're doing for universal giving? You mean as far as getting the companies and helping them all give one, one, one? Right. You know, we have to, it's a very good question, Sa Sanjeev? Sajis. Sajis. S-A-J-I. S-A-J-I. 
Say it again. Saji. Saji. So Saji, it's a very good question because there's certain models that are out there that are very, very powerful. And I love what I learned from you tonight that you're taking that corporate model and actually kind of thinking about it in your own life too, you know, uh, which is great. Every single one of our clients has different philosophies and we have to be careful about not promoting one type of philosophy over another. What we do look at at each company is they have all have beautiful and unique ways to give, very unique ways, and we want to highlight what those are that are important to the company. So what we will do is we will highlight the example of Salesforce, or we will highlight the example of Cisco, but we don't encourage it with any one company because they all have their unique DNA. What we do instead is we highlight what the positive examples are, but we don't promote any one. All right, I think that's it. I hope this was helpful to you. And um, you're welcome to contact me. You have my cards. And anyone who wants to contact me now or six months down the road, you're, you're welcome to do it. And I hope you find great volunteering and some way to serve on your way home tonight. All right, good night. <laughs> Pamela, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, as you see, Pamela is passing around the list to get signed up for her newsletter. By all means, sign it and stay in touch with Pamela. Thank you. And her organization, Universal Giving. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you. <laughs>